In the Philippine Star this morning, columnist Babes Romualdez talks about the power crisis in Mindanao. I'm sure you've come upon that in the various headlines we've had this week across various papers. And it seems to be a bigger problem than we first realized. Because if the Mindanao power crisis is not resolved as soon as possible, it's just a matter of time before it will go over into Visayas. And when Visayas is a power crisis, it's just a matter of time before it goes over into Luzon. And I remind you that Luzon is where we are. We could be in darkness very soon, and I hope that doesn't happen. You see, now the energy secretary is blaming Congress, and congressmen are blaming him, and some people are blaming the National Power Corporation, and some are blaming the Department of Energy. Now, the Department of Energy is blaming the local power cooperatives in Mindanao. It's a blame game going on. And you know what happens in a blame game? Nothing gets resolved or done. Nobody wants to own up to the problem because of pride and self-preservation. Lord, help us. And friends, it's not just countries that are affected by pride and selfishness to have a power crisis. It's also people, spiritually, who can be affected and have a spiritual power crisis because of pride and selfishness, that is what Paul is going to talk about this morning in our passage. He makes himself the example in contrast to the situation in our country. In verses 8 to 10, you remember Paul said, There is nothing more important for me, he said, than that I get to know Jesus Christ. I will build my whole life. I will give up everything if I could know Jesus Christ deeply. Personally, intimately, everything else is secondary to that. Everything else, I will give it up. And I have given it up, he said. If I could just know Jesus Christ, not know about him, but know him, himself, deeply, personally, intimately, now he makes a qualifier, is a clarification that he begins our passage with this morning, friends. In verse 12, he is now saying, I've not yet Achieve that. It's very important that he say so. Before we delve into the details, could you join me? A word of prayer. Father, we thank you for the testimony of the Apostle Paul, who continues what we've looked at the last week. Nothing matters more than knowing Christ. Everything else, Lord, could be sacrificed for that. But thank you, Lord, that we cannot just look at his life and then say good for him and then feel despair about ourselves. Lord, we can look at his life and realize we're just the same. Thank you, Father. Help us aspire. Help us desire. Help us strain forward just like he did to know Christ, even though we may not reach perfection in this life. And yet, you do not want us to build our lives on anything else except pursuing to know Christ and to be like Him. Speak to our hearts, we pray. Let your Spirit take your words, plant them in the hearts of people, and change lives. We don't want a lecture today, Lord. We don't want heads filled with information. We want lives transformed. Because you will renew minds by the power of your Spirit. Make it so, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. So Paul gives this clarification. To remove any misunderstanding, he says, I have not yet reached perfection. Which is the same as knowing Christ perfectly and fully is equivalent to perfection in this life. You know why it's equivalent? If you could tell me that you have known Christ perfectly and fully, it also means you're perfectly like Him. Because as you get to know Jesus Christ, you become more and more like Him. So if somebody tells you, I already know Christ perfectly and fully, the first thing you should ask is, are you completely like Him? If you are, you're perfect. And what Paul is saying is, it's not possible, it seems to be, in this life, to be there. And yet, he's saying, pursue that. Pursue that even though no one is there yet, not even him. 
Paul aspired to be called up to receive from God the award he desired. It's the same thing we desire, full knowledge of Christ. But such could only be achieved at the end of this life. When God calls us home, either through the rapture or it could be through death. And friends, I know all of us want to be winning Christians in that sense. We want to fulfill the purposes for which we have been saved. So while perfection on earth is not possible, what are the essentials for pursuing it? Because Paul highlights that we should. And this is the word of God. And one day, as we pursue it, we will receive the reward that is promised, which is actually to see Christ, and then know Him fully at that time and become like Him. What will it take, friends, so that we could achieve that price, the price meant for you and me? First of all, in verses 12 and 13, the first one that we are being told is that it requires humility. Look at verse 12. Not that I have already obtained all this or have already been made perfect. Verse 13. Brothers, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it. So you see in verse 12, he's already equating what I just told you about. Knowing Christ fully is equivalent in the sight of Paul and in the word of God to becoming perfect. And he says, I'm not there yet. Of all people, you would have expected Paul to say that. The super apostle, the greatest apostle of of all of them used by God to bring the gospel to Gentiles like you and me. Yet he says, I'm not there yet. And then verse 13, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it. What do you call that? That's humility. The first essential to winning the prize meant for us, the price of knowing Christ fully and coming closer to perfection, is simply humility. If you remember, in Philippians chapter 2, verse 3, we define humility in terms of interpersonal relationships. What is that? It is to treat the needs of others more important than my own. That's interpersonal humility. What Paul is referring to here now is intrapersonal. It's within himself. It's how he views himself, specifically with regard to spiritual progress. And he's saying Simply that the mark of the humble and mature person is not to reckon yourself perfect, but to realize that you still have a long way to go and much good still to do. He is actually speaking against what you would call today Christian perfection from legalism. Remember, the opponents of Paul in Philippians chapter 3, verse 2 were legalists. They were Judaizers who were saying, you know what, you could achieve what God wants you to become by following all the Jewish customs, circumcision, Jewish rituals, Jewish uh, holidays, and all of those. And Paul is countering that. He says, you can't achieve that. And he counts them, he says, as rubbish. And Paul urges all that who claim to be already perfect to realize that in this life on earth, True Christian perfection consists only in striving for perfection. Paul is afraid that those who think they are perfect now will cease their efforts, falsely thinking they have achieved their goal, whereas Paul knows that the goal is at the end. I hope that's clear to you. It's at the end of our lives that we become perfect. When we see Christ face to face, we know Him perfectly then. Because we no longer see through a glass darkly, as 1 Corinthians 13 says. We already see Him face to face. And at that moment, we become like Him. We know Him perfectly and fully. That's the only time, friends. I'm reminded of Luke 18, 9 to 14. Jesus gave this story because He said, To some who were confident of their own righteousness and looked down on everybody else, Jesus told this parable. Two men went to the temple to to pray, one a Pharisee, the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood up and prayed about himself. That's interesting. Have you ever prayed about himself like this? God, I thank you I am not like other men. Robbers, evildoers, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. Uh, He was referring to the other guy. I fast twice a week. He must be pretty slim. 
I give a tenth of all I get. So this is a self-righteous man. He believes in himself. But verse 13 of Luke 18, But the tax collector stood at a distance. He would not even look up to heaven, but beat his breast and said, God have mercy on me, a sinner. That's the only thing he could say. He could not even look up to God. His head was bowed. He was beating his breast. God have mercy on me, a sinner. The outcome, Jesus says in verse 14, I tell you, this man, this tax collector, rather than the Pharisee, went home justified before God. And the word justified there used in the original is the same as used for forgiven. He was forgiven before God. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. If I think, or you think you have arrived spiritually, you've just lost it. That's what it means. Pride makes you weaker, not stronger. There was supposedly one door-to-door salesman who closed dozens of sales with this line. Uh, Please don't imitate this. He says to every door he would open, let me show you something your neighbor said you could never afford. So he would prey on men's pride to make them buy things they really didn't need. Because pride makes you vulnerable, not stronger. It's like this this woman. She goes to her pastor and says, Pastor, you have to pray for me. I have a besetting sin. It's a sin I cannot get rid of. So the pastor said, what is that sin? Uh, Whenever I go to church on Sunday, I look at all the other women in church. I realize I am the prettiest lady in the whole church. (laughs) Pastor, you have to help me get rid of this sin. The pastor wisely said, young lady, that's not a sin, that's just an honest mistake. (laughs) So, I hope you do not have that problem. But anyway, friends, that is the problem with pride. It makes you think you're something, and people can see into you, they can see through you, and it's not what you think it really is. That is the first thing that Paul mentions here. Humility. Just recognize where you are. You and I, we're still very far from it instead of saying, I have already arrived. But number two, Paul would mention something else in verses 12 and 14. It's persistence. Persistence. Verse 12, I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Verse 14, I press on. Those three words are exactly the same in the original language. I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. Verse 12, verse 14, in English and in the original, exactly the same phrase. I press on. That's persistence. Paul is saying, press on in God's power. Don't give up. Don't quit. That's all he's saying. Pursue what God wants you to pursue. That's the price, he said, for which God has called me heavenward. What is that price? The price of knowing Christ and becoming like Him perfectly, completely. It's a price worth pursuing in this life, even though you know it will be fulfilled only at the end of our lives. And Paul used the image of a runner, an athlete, who hopes to win the prize stretching for the finish line to describe the Christian walk. It's a good analogy for a believer. You could never be considered in the Olympic Games during that time to be a representative worthy of being an athlete unless you were a citizen of the nation you represented. That's obvious. But you also had to be a free man, not a slave. So in the same way, the Christian is a citizen of heaven. Set free by Christ. Our task, according to Paul, is to lay hold of that for which Christ laid hold of us. What does that mean? It is laying hold of the potential. Whatever God has made for you and me to to fulfill. When he saved us, and that is again, friends, simply becoming fully and perfectly like the Lord Jesus Christ. God saved us. To be conformed to the image of His Son. That's very clear in Romans 8, 
29. So Paul is not talking about uh, people getting saved when they run this Christian race, but he's talking about Christians already and their growth and progress in their Christian walk. And like we said, the prize is the heavenward call to fully know and become like Jesus Christ. It's like Hebrews chapter 12, 1 to 3. This is a beautiful verse for us to think about. The writer of Hebrews, which may or may not have been Paul, says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, who are these witnesses? All the great people mentioned in Hebrews chapter 11, the hall of faith. And he's saying, they are people who have set the standard for you. Let us now throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. And let's run with perseverance. The race marked out for us. There you have again the metaphor of a race. There you have again the exhortation to run with perseverance. That's I press on for Paul. Verse 2, let us fix our eyes on Jesus the author, author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, sat down at the right hand of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinful men, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. You want to understand what I press on means? It is defined here. I press on means I take off every sin. That so easily entangles. I take of all hindrances which will keep me from running the race well. And then it says here, I take off my eyes from anything and anyone except Jesus Christ. I don't look at my spiritual leaders. They're human beings. They might fail. I don't look at some famous religious figure like like perhaps Chuck Swindoll or Charles Stanley. Instead, I fix my eyes on Jesus. And then in verse 3, knowing our human nature, he says, consider Christ, who in your opposition, he knows one hindrance to I press on, to persistence, is opposition. So Hebrews 12, 1 to 3 defines for us what it means to press on. Throw everything that distracts you. Get rid of sin that entangles you. Fix your eyes on Christ and no one else. And then endure opposition, just like Jesus said, so that you not grow weary and lose heart. You and I should take the attitude of that little boy who was standing at the top of an escalator. So he stood there for a long, long time just watching the handrails return again and again. So people were looking at him. And then finally one man said, uh, little boy, why are you looking at that escalator handrail? You've been there a long time. He said, uh, you see, sir, I put my chewing gum on that handrail. I'm waiting for it to return. Now that's persistence. My friends, the point is this. No? If, if it's worth pursuing, if it's a worthy goal, it's worth pursuing again and again and again, Proverbs 24, 16. Though a righteous man falls seven times, he rises again. That's a righteous man. But the wicked are brought down by calamity. Albert Einstein once said, It's not that I'm so smart. It's just that I stay with problems longer. Now, he's understating his intelligence, but he's doing this to make a point. He succeeded in life because he was persistent, not just intelligent. Because of Proverbs 24, 16, you and I need to remind ourselves perhaps often that the difference between being a wise man and a fool, the difference between being righteous and wicked is determined by my willingness to get up and keep going again and again and again. Have you fallen down? Has it happened more than once, spiritually? During such times, you might be tempted to give up and say, Lord, Christian life isn't worth it. I keep failing you, Lord. Friends, if it's worth pursuing one time, it's worth 10, 20, or 100 times, just get back 
Return to your Lord. Ask forgiveness if you have to, if you failed Him. If you fall down, rise up, go back to Him. Because, friends, the men and women who have moved the world have been the men and women whom the world could not move. That's persistent. That's refusing to give up. That's refusing to quit. Not just being humble and saying, I'm not there yet. It's saying, I'm not there yet, but I'll keep pursuing it. I might have failed yesterday. I'll get back today. I might fail next week. I'll go back to the Lord. And I will keep going back to God because there's no other place, no other person I'll run to. That's humility and then persistence. Thirdly, friends, there is something else we see in the text, and that's focus. Focus found in verse 13. Look at what Paul said. But one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead. Now, when I was younger, I said, now, Paul, you don't know your map. These are two things. One thing I do, forgetting what's behind, straining toward what is ahead. And then I realized, well, you can't do one without the other. You can't strain toward what is ahead as long as you're looking at your back. That's what Paul is saying. So it's just one thing. Too many Christians live divided lives. One part enjoys the world. The other part tries to live for God. And so they get pulled into different directions. They get nowhere. So Paul said, one thing, forget what's behind. Let's look at that first. It means, Hebrews 12, 2, keep your eyes on Christ and forget the past. Forget your past sins and failures. They'll just discourage you. Forget your past successes. They'll just make you proud. Forget those who've hurt you. You cannot undo that. Forget your failures because you cannot undo what you've done or unsay what you have said. You have to move on with your life, my friends. Make restoration if you have to, but move on with your life. What's done is done. The nostalgia of the former life and the good old days of our Christian life will just paralyze us in terms of what God wants us to become in the future. Every day is a new adventure. Every day is a new way to live. Forget the past with all its failures and successes. All those things that could paralyze us with guilt, with discouragement, or make us complacent with pride and stretch out to the future. And then he says something else. He says, I'm straining toward what is ahead. So again, friends, this is the athletic metaphor that Paul is using. The phrase straining towards in the original is actually a very graphic word picture. It brings to mind the straining muscles, clear focus, and complete dedication of the athlete, a runner stretching towards the finish line. That's what Paul is using here. It requires mental and physical discipline. It's an athlete with every nerve and muscle stretched out. His body is leaning forward. His eyes are fixed firmly on the goal. And everything is thrown into a final effort to reach the prize that he is aiming for. And Paul is saying, this is my life as a believer. This is my ceaseless exertion, my own intensity of desire to reach the end of life and know Jesus Christ fully and completely and become like him someday. That's all that matters to me. That's the price. I'm forgetting the past. I'm reaching forward toward what is ahead. And I'm building my life around that. In August 7, 1954, there happened one of the most replayed moments in track and field history. It was a one-on-one -on -one contest between the only two men, as of August 7, 1954, who had run the mile in less than four minutes. It was Roger Bannister, who's now a medical doctor, by the way, and John Landy, August 7, 1954. Both of them were the only human beings who had ever run a mile in less than four minutes. And the whole world was watching on TV as they 
had this competition between them who could run faster. Each of them had different strategies. Roger Bannister thought, I will save my energy and give it in the final stretch just before the finish line. John Landy decided early on he will give it 100% from the starting point until the finish line. So when the gun, uh, when the gun exploded, signaling in the start of the race, it became very obvious that Roger Bannister had made a mistake. You see, the gap between him and John Landy was very wide. He was left far behind. So just a few yards before the finish line, with a big gap between them, the crowd suddenly roared in excitement. And John Landy made a mistake that has been replayed over and over and over again. He looked back at Roger Bannister. In that one split second, Roger Bannister gave his final effort just a few yards before the finish line and won by a narrow margin. What happened? He looked back instead of straining towards what is ahead. When you're a believer in Christ, anything else, friend, that takes your focus away from Jesus Christ, will not make you finish well. Whatever it is, it could be your career, it could be even your family, it could be your wealth, your net assets, your, your, your properties, your reputation, your education, your children, your wife, your husband, whatever it is that you look at instead of Jesus Christ, maybe even your reputation, when you guard that, when you guard your security rather than put your eyes on Christ, you will not finish well. Let's learn from that. Let us not look away from Jesus Christ. There is only one person you and I should ever fix our eyes upon. He's the prize. Knowing Him fully, completely, and becoming like Him. Otherwise, we may not finish well, and that is focus, my friend. Let us not take our eyes of Jesus Christ. And finally, our final point is found in verses 15 to 16, and that's simply community. And this is a beautiful point. I'd like to highlight this. It says, all of us who are mature should take such a view of things. What view? That we forget what is past that we strain toward what is ahead and we press on. That's the view that Paul is referring to. If on some point you think differently, that too God will make clear to you. Here is Paul being very loving. He's saying, if you don't agree with me, it's all right. I just hope the Lord makes it plain to you. That's a loving way of saying, you may not agree with me, but I hope God will make it clear to you. And verse 16, only... Let us live up to what we have already attained. God has built it into us. The potential to reach that, let's live up to that. Because there were some who had a different attitude about what Paul taught. And Paul lovingly commends them to God, who alone can correct them. In the meantime, all he's saying is this. Why don't we work together as a community? Let's help each other. Let us not tear each other down. Let us sometimes agree to disagree without being disagreeable. Isn't that possible, friends? We can agree to disagree. We don't have to be disagreeable. We can still love each other. And what I learned here, friends, is that personal wholeness is usually a corporate process in the New Testament. It's something that happens in community. Hebrews 10, 24 to 25 says, Let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together, but encouraging one another. That is corporate holiness, people helping each other be holy. In 1 Peter 2, 5, Christians are encouraged to be built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood. Verse 9 of chapter 2, they are a holy nation. 1 Thessalonians 5, 11. They are to encourage one another and build each other up. 
is significant. If you look at the fruits of the Spirit in Galatians 5, 22 to 23, love, joy, peace, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, they are all things that build community, fellowship, collective holiness. Whereas the works of the flesh, which are mentioned in Galatians 5, 19 to 21, are the things that destroy community, fornication, impurity, idolatry, enmity, strife, jealousy, anger, envy, carousing. These are things that destroy the fellowship of God's people with each other. That's community. All of us helping each other instead of pulling each other down. In the Bible, Paul talks about the needed roles in the church in 1 Corinthians 12. And he's saying there in so many words, not everybody could be a pastor, a missionary, an evangelist, because that's the equivalent of having a body composed only of an eye or an ear. Can you imagine a walking eye or ear on the road? Not only is it grotesque and ugly, it's non-functional. I wouldn't want to feed uh, an eye with something. It's impossible, and that's a, an example that Paul is using. Because what God desires, my friends, is for each of us to build each other up. I'll close with this. Dr. Halbeck is a missionary in South Africa. He lived near a leper colony, and in fact, he helped them one time. He saw two lepers who were trying to plant seed in a field. Now, friends, leprosy is a very destructive disease. It makes you lose your limbs. One of the lepers had no more hands. The other leper had no more feet. And this is what they did so that they could plant seeds in the field. The one without hands carried on his back the one without feet. Can you imagine that? The one without hands carried on his back the one without feet. And so, the one riding on the back, because he had no feet, would drop a seed as they were walking along the field. And then the one carrying him who had no hands used his feet to press down the seed. That's good teamwork. And as the two of them compensated for each other's weaknesses, they were able to sow seed in that field. They completed each other. You know, brothers and sisters, in one sense, sin like leprosy has rendered all of us damaged goods. I know we can become believers in Christ, that's great. But while we are in the flesh, sometimes the damage of sin will be with us throughout life. Sin like leprosy has damaged all of us, and even after salvation, we are still works in progress. And we can either tear each other down, highlighting the weaknesses you see in God's people who are still work in progress, or we can help each other. We can build each other up, or we can point out each other's faults and weaknesses. In God's family that we call the church, the call is to build each other up as a community, not to tear each other down. To build on each other's strengths, not pick on each other's weaknesses, because we are all damaged goods. Let us help each other build each other up, not tear each other down. And my brothers and sisters, God save you and me to win, not to lose. As we humbly accept how far we are from knowing Christ, as we persistently and wholeheartedly seek to know Him together with other believers in community, as a body, as a family, in God's perfect way and time, together, all of us, we will reach our goal. And win the prize meant for you and me. In humility, in persistence, in focus, and most of all, in community. We can win the prize meant for you and me. 
Let's pray. Father, we thank you that becoming like Christ is not a futile, frustrating experience that you've set before us so that we will be discouraged, so that we will feel bad about ourselves. In love, you saved us. You forgave us our sins. And now you're saying you live up to what Christ laid hold of you for, which is to know him, become like him. Help us, Father, pursue that with humility, as Paul said, with persistence, not giving up. Help us keep our eyes on Christ. And then help us as a loving family, as a church, as a community. Help us build each other up. Complement each other's strengths instead of highlighting each other's weaknesses so that we help each other, Lord, become like you want us to be. We help each other win the prize that you meant for us. Thank you because of the truth of your words. In Jesus' name. Amen.